We'll go ahead and get started for the evening so we can make sure that we answer as many questions as we can. So again, good evening, everyone. My name is Maritza Gayaga, and I am the Interim Chief of Public Affairs and Communications for Round Rock ISD. And I, again, I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual information session on the Round Rock ISD Police Department. Safety and security and, and the well-being of our students is a priority in our community. In fact, as a school district, it's our number one priority, and we work together to help keep our students, our staff, and our entire community safe. I'd like to thank everyone, every one of our attendees for being with us tonight. I know that you guys have busy schedules, um, so thank you for tuning in. I also want to thank our panelists for being here and sharing their knowledge, e experiences, and expertise with us, and also our ASL interpreter um, helping us out this evening. I'm still seeing a few people join us, so while we wait for those people to come in, I'm going to share a little bit of information on what our virtual session is going to look like this evening. To start, each of our panelists is going to share some information on their role and how they support safety and security, how they support our campuses, and just information that would be helpful for our community to know. From there, we'll take questions from the audience. Um, for our audience members here with us today, please use the Q&A feature to submit your question. Uh, we will go through and we'll, we'll answer as many questions as we can. And we also have questions that were previously submitted through the police forum questionnaire form. So we'll answer those as well. Again, we are gonna go through as many questions as we can, but if you still have questions after today, please use the Let's Talk feature on roundrockisd.org to submit your question. I know our police department does a great job of working with our community to get them um, responses as quickly as we can. So again, let's talk on roundrockisd.org. And finally, for those who tune in late or are unable to be with us today, a recording of this meeting with closed captioning will be available on the district safety and security website and posted on the district social media channels in the coming days. Um, so with that overview, let's go ahead and get started for the evening. Um, we're going to go ahead and start introducing our panelists. So panelists, I'm going to introduce you one by one and ask a few questions to help you get started with your introduction. So our first panelist this evening that I'd like to introduce is Dennis Weiner, our Chief of Police. So, so Dennis, can you please uh, share a little about your role, how you serve students, and, and how you work with our campuses? Sure, thank you, and welcome everyone. Thanks for taking the time uh, to be with us tonight. Really important we get our message out. We have an opportunity to talk with the community about um, the great work we do every day. And so, you know, I, I've been the Police Chief here with the district since August of uh, last year. And I've had a real opportunity to get to know um, not just the staff, but uh, some of the students, uh, not as many as I'd like to get to know, but I've gotten to know some uh, people as I get to work through my, my daily activities. Um, what brought me to this district particularly was the, um, was the opportunity to work in a, a really innovative model. And I think um, the foundational values that this department was built on uh, really uh, shouted out to me that this was a unique opportunity to really make an impact on students' lives and to improve student outcomes. And I think we do that through, you know, our, our four core values, which is safety and security, um, having a focus on equity, really being strong student advocates, and then uh, also identifying opportunities to provide mental health services where appropriate. And I, I think um, coming at uh, police work from that perspective is, is new. Uh, it's not really done anywhere else in the country. And I think what we've seen are some really um, hopeful success stories that show that we're doing things right. And so I'm really uh, excited about the opportunity to tonight to hear about some of the experiences that our staff and officers have had with this model. And so with that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll wait until later to answer some other questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And so next, uh, let's see, we have our Assistant Police Chief, Rose White. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I feel very blessed to be here uh, among the staff that we have. I researched uh, Chief Weiner um, said, this is a really great place. Now I'm from Florida and I've lived my entire adult life in Florida, but he said, look at what this district offers for its students, its staff, its community. And I thought, what a great opportunity to go and spread the knowledge that I've acquired. I've spent 20 years in a school district police department. So uh, with that being said, I think I bring a lot to the table in helping us grow together. And the model that we use here is by far the best I've worked, worked within. Um, I have 30 years of law enforcement experience altogether. So this is absolutely the best, most rewarding 
uh, model that there is. I just want to add that, you know, Rose also has experience as kindergarten teacher. So she's got, she's got a uh, perspective from both sides of the aisle, if you would. She often tells us she was the original kindergarten cop. So. <laughs> So awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Rose. And so right next to Rose, we kind of have the one, two, three, um, <laughs> as well as the order of the introduction of panelists. So next we have Dr. Amy Grosso, who's our director of behavioral services. Um, so Amy, can you share a little bit about your role and how you serve students and how, how you work with our campuses and police department as well? Absolutely. I have the honor of supporting a team of social workers that work with our campuses in a variety of different ways. Um, this position was created in January of 2020. So I always say it was perfect timing right before the pandemic and the needs that would come from students. Um, and then we hired our first social workers October of 2020. We have 10 social workers, two per learning community. You'll he hear from one of them tonight. Then we have two social workers that more help on higher level critical incident, more of a, I would say crisis, but you know, those high level things. We have one social worker that supports our staff. We found the need that our staff needed one person just that they could go to. And then we also have a coordinator of social work services. We really help students who have a higher level of need for mental health, um, connections with community resources, and then we work with the entire family. Um, I also oversee the process of our suicide protocols and also our threat assessment. And so those are the things that um, I get to do every day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and so next we go from one end to the other end of the screen. And so next we have Sam Soto, who is our principal at Blue Bonnet Elementary. Um, so Sam, could you please introduce yourself um, and talk a little about how you work with the district's police department, how they support your campus on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sam Soto, prop principal over at Blue Bonnet Elementary. Um, I've been, I've had the fortune to, uh, to participate in several interview committees um, uh, for the police department here in our district from as a, it's an initiation. Um, my campus has worked closely with several uh, SROs, several police officers in the district um, in a variety of ways. Uh, one of them being um, being able to um, have some of the officers come and be mentors uh, to some of our students here at the elementary level. Uh, my community is a blue collar community uh, we're a working class community here at Blue Bonnet. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that we're working on is uh, being able to establish a good rapport, good relationships with our community members or students. Uh, sometimes some of our students have, uh, and some of our students' parents have not had the best interactions with law enforcement over the years. Uh, so that's something that we're looking at, at changing. Um, and then when we do, when our students do see police officers here in our building, um, I want them to feel comfortable. Uh, I want them to feel at ease. And then also, I think it helps that we have uh, officers that, that, such as Officer Magañez, that you'll hear uh, from in a little bit. Uh, he's one of our, our mentors uh, that spends time with some of our students uh, during the course of the week. Um, so that's some of the ways that that um, my campus has been in um, uh, cooperating and, and collaborating, I should say, with our, our district's police department. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Sam, for giving us just some insight. Um, and next we have, I think he's your your officer, and I think you guys work together. But Daniel, and please forgive me for if I if I do say your last name wrong. Um Magal Magalanes. It's Magallanes. Thank you. Everybody Thank you. In the God. district calls me Mag, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, officer Mags. Yes. So, um, can you please just introduce yourself, um, how you work with Blue Bonnet and how you support our students? Yeah, of course. So just a little bit about me. I've been with the district, uh, with the police department since it, or it originated back in 2020. I'm currently assigned as a district-wide officer, meaning I don't have a home campus, but I'm proud to say that while my short time here, I've done a short stint at every high school and every middle school at the campus. Now, being a district-wide officer, it it provides me with unique opportunities. One of them is working alongside Principal Soto at that blue bonnet it gives me the opportunity to work with with kids that have had bad days um kids that are struggling in school kids with uh behavioral problems spanish-speaking students that are having a hard time adjusting you know and and students that sometimes just need a, a role model in their life you know and on any given day that i'm there um we'll have breakfast you know we'll 
we'll shoot some hoops, play basketball, um, you know, we'll play soccer or we'll, we'll just engage in a conversation, you know, and a lot of these conversations are not, you know, lectures, you know, they're, they're kids talking about life, kids talking about, you know, what they want to do when they grow up. They're talking about, you know, right and right from wrong. So um, this mentor program, it, it, it goes it goes back to when the department originated, you know, um, first when the, when the PD first started. Um, an officer showed up one day, kind of ran with it. Um, and now I'm just lucky enough to, to carry to carry that on on, you know, on a weekly basis when I can. Um, this mentor program that we have is just one of the different methods that we use um, to get kids to feel safe around us, to to get them comfortable, to trust us, um, and just to show them that we're there for them on a daily basis, not just when they're in trouble. So. So thank you so much, Danny, or, or Officer Max, now that I, I have that. Um, and so next we have Jackie Hartle, who is our uh, Director of Special Education Behavioral Services. So Jackie, can you please, um, of course, introduce yourself and how you and your officer work together on a daily basis? And can you please provide an example of, of how you guys have worked together? It doesn't have to be campus specific, but just something general to help inform our community on the relationship that takes place. Or how sure, you guys I'd be happy to. Uh, so my name is Jackie Hartle. I am the Director of Special Education Behavioral Services here in the district, uh, which means I support and guide our SPED behavioral services on all of our secondary campuses in the district. Uh, those services are called Achieve and Focus, those programs. Um, uh, my main uh, time is spent as Director of our uh, specialized program for students with challenging behaviors due to their disability, uh, and that is called Goals. So I am uh, proud principal of Goals uh, Learning Community, but uh, what I want to make sure that that I am am clear on is I have such a deep respect and care for the officers and the social workers that support our campuses and our students. Uh, I we could not do this work without them, uh, and I really consider them part of our team. So the officers that are assigned to my campus. Um, they come by two or three times a day. They know the kids by name. It really helps our students that do have some aversion to law enforcement, that do, are nervous around um, people in uniform feel better around them because they realize that they're, they're just people wanting to keep everybody safe. And then when we do need to call them because um, we have some unsafe behavior going on, then they already have a relationship with the student. They already, they, are, they can talk to that student by name. They know their idiosyncrasies they can help with that. And it has been very, very um, healthy for our kids. Um, we've been able to intervene and have officers help us and have officers get additional support when we know we need more mental health support on, on campus um, to, to support our students. Um, and it's kept, it's kept um, something that could be, you know, really bad from, from happening. And it's happened on our campus in more than one time this year. So, uh, it's not even just the two officers attached to our campus. We have we have officers from all over. The sergeants are very helpful. Officer Mags was here today uh, and got to meet some of our students. So um, I am very grateful for our police department and for our social workers. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, next, we have Lisa Clear. She's our East District K-9 Sergeant. So can you please, uh, Lisa, can you please introduce yourself and how you work um, with our students and support them as well? And I don't know if you have your, your dog with you, but that would be kind of awesome to have within the... Within I our do. Uh, let me see if I can move the camera down here. So there is Puff. He's right next to me. Um, so my name is uh, Sergeant Lisa Clear. I'm, as I said, I'm the East District Sergeant um, for Round Rock ISD. So I have the Cedar Ridge Vertical Learning Community and the Stony Point uh, Learning Community under me. So I have all of the schools plus eight officers that fall under me. Um, I am also the Sergeant over the Canine Program, which um, we started about a year ago. I have been with the district since day one, since we started in September of 2020. Um, I'm in my 13th year of law enforcement. Um, I did do about seven years previously um, as a patrol street officer. Um, and then when I got the opportunity 
um, a little over six years ago to come work with kids in schools. I found that that was my calling. Um, I absolutely love working with, with kids. Um, you know, they need that mentorship and the guidance. And so when I got to Round Rock, um, it was COVID. So, you know, mental health and behavioral health was so prominent. And um, the previous administration that was here, we got to talking about um, the canine department and stuff like that, because I've been a canine officer for a little over 10 years now. And so I did the street uh, canine part of policing before. And when I came over, I said, you know, I said, Round Rock isn't needing a traditional canine program right now. I said, I've, I've heard great things about therapy dogs and behavioral um, therapy dogs in school districts. And I said, that's what Round Rock needs. I said, you know, to have a dog help someone that's um, having a crisis movement or a bad day, or, um, you know, whether it's students or staff, we can come in and you can have a little bit of puppy loving and that makes the day a little bit better wherever we go, when we go into classes, when we go to admin buildings, or if we go to meet the principals and APs and teachers, they're like, oh man, you know, I had a little bit of puppy loving and I feel a lot better and it made my day and it helped release some stress and some tension. And we use those for kids that a lot of times that are, um, you know, having a bad day, they'll call us in and we can bring the dog in and it helps calm. And then they're, you know, they're wanting to talk. They're wanting to open up. They're decompressing a little bit. And so it's, it's better for everyone. Um, so that's, that's what I do here in the district. I do a little bit of everything. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Puff, as well, for just being here. Um, can, I, can I just add um, to that while we're talking about the dogs is that, you know, our uh, therapy dogs are used by both the, the social workers and the officers, and they're interchangeable. So they're used in different situations, depending on, you know, what the needs of the student are. And so I just wanted to point that out. We do a lot of proactive work with the dogs. So when the, ch when the children are not in um, a crisis, we try to introduce the dogs to them so that they're more comfortable when they are in crisis, that the dogs can help them come down and de-escalate. So it's very strategic on how we use them, and they've been a huge benefit across the district. I know um, uh, Jackie probably could speak a little bit to having the dogs on campus once in a while and, and the effect that they have. Yes, sir. And to go off of what Chief had said, and I apologize, I forgot to mention. So um, also our handlers aren't just officers. So we actually have two of our social workers that are our handlers for one of our canine winter. And Alex is one of our handlers um, for one of our, our dogs. Um, so we work as a team. And so it's, it's a, a team effort. And we also have backup handlers. So sometimes um, you know, we can have, we have like a social worker that can come, um, and, and help us out and stuff like that. So it's, it's been a great program. Um, and like, so it's, it's, it's team effort and we're just, we're here for, for the students and the, and the staff and to make, you know, everybody's, everybody's day a little bit better. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and so next we have Dr. Mac Eagleton. He is the principal of McNeil High School. So Dr. Eagle Eagleton, can you please introduce yourself, um, how you and your officer work together on a day-to-day -day basis, and if you could provide an example of how this partnership supports campus safety. All right, I am Dr. Mac Eagleton. I am the super proud principal of McNeil High School. Um, honestly, our um, officers that um, work on our campus every day um, really are part of our team. I mean, I. Although when you're looking at teachers or faculty, staff, students, and administration, and our officers, our titles may be different, but in, in the end of it all, um, we really work very well together and look at our uh, expertise and experiences as um, contributing factors to our overall safety. And so um, for us, when, when I have meetings with administration or sometimes with teachers, officers are, are part of that conversation, um, whether it's um, looking at or analyzing our emergency operations protocols or evacuations, um, having meetings after them to talk about what do we do well, how can we improve, whether it's looking at uh, checking exterior doors and making sure they're locked or interior doors or um, those aspects of, of safety. Uh, our officers are really, really very involved, but not just in those areas, but in, in terms of passing periods. Our officers, are, wherever kids are, 
um, they tend to find themselves there. And so um, whether it's passing period, whether it's during the lunchtime, pep rallies, um, really a part of our school. And I, I think the most important thing um, besides kind of the plant management aspect of it in terms of locked doors and all those kinds of things, um, I really think that the greatest benefit for safety in our campus is that our officers also work with us in building uh, the appropriate relationships and rapport with students um, and not students or individuals who are in trouble or have some type of, of offense is just being a part of the school community. Um, and so you'll see uh, kids talking to myself, kids talking to teachers, kids talking to secretaries, kids talking to police officers um, just for the sake of it. And so um, I think that um, sense of camaraderie, that collective act of really ensuring and being intentional about providing safety for our kids just holistically um, is really, really um, relevant and powerful. Um, recently, a specific situation where there was kind of an issue with one of our students. Um, and once we kind of got the situation handled, it was administration and the police individually and collectively just talking to the kid and meeting his needs um, just in general, um, just providing um, support um, and um, really encouragement um, about decisions and making right decisions and supporting you and here are the resources just so you really, you know, although our officers are in, in a different uniform, they look, um, they dress much better than me on a daily basis. Um, our work in terms of how we work together to help our kids and not just our kids, but faculty and staff is really united. And so um, in terms of that, I think the culture of safety is not just a buzzword, but it's really an experience at our campus. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Eagleton, uh, for that. And I know we have your, your officer with someone that you work very closely with, Bandy Watson. Um, so, Bandy, could you please introduce yourself and explain a little bit of how you guys work together on a on a day-to-day -day basis? And if you have an example of how you guys have worked together to support campus safety, that would be awesome as well. All right. Good evening, y'all. My name is Bandy Watson. I've been with the district since uh, 2001. Uh, I have 25 years of military experience. Uh, I retired. Uh, one thing about what we do here is we we work hand in hand with our administration, like Dr. Eagleson said, but my calling was being with the students. I'm out and about. I go to the, uh, like you said, the prep rallies. I'm always in the hallways, the lunch periods. And I like to engage with the students. I, I have these things that I call icebreakers when uh, we have new students that come on to our campus to kind of kind of get them at ease because going from maybe a small private school to come into a, uh, you know, a larger school with like over 2,700 kids, it can be challenging. It can be intimidating. So I try to just, you know, kind of break that ice and let them know that we're here for them. We're advocates for students versus if you just see a police uniform, because this day and age, we, you see a police in uniform, we always get this uh, uh, certain demeanor towards us, you know, that's, you know, rightfully, I, I understand where it's coming from, but us in the schools, we're trying to, you know, let them be at ease and let them know that we're here for them. Uh, we work closely with our, our behavioral health, our social workers. Uh, actually, my social worker who's on who's on the panel with us is office is like right behind mine. So we always bouncing ideas off each other. And uh, it kind of it kind of helps us uh, get through the day to day operations. Uh, getting back to one of the incidents, like Dr. Egerton said, we uh, we we noticed that a situation. Uh, we didn't we didn't make a big deal of it. We we did what we had to do, uh, keeping safety in mind, and, and the situation was handled relatively uh quickly. Uh, you know, parents were involved, uh, all the administration was involved. So one thing I can say, I can brag on my uh administration, they're always, always involved in everything that we do as far as campus operations. We have this thing called a morning huddle every morning where we have to give good news. It don't matter what type of good news it is, but that's how we kind of get our day started. So it's something that you can kind of start your day knowing that you're giving some good news and, you know, you're going about your day. All righty, Officer Watson, thank you so much. And so next we have one of our social workers. We have Alex uh, Greg, Greg Ray. Can you it's it's Gregory, but it's spelled super weird. So thank yeah. you, Alex Gregory. Yeah, again, she's one of our social workers. So if you could please introduce yourself and how you serve our students and how you work with our campuses. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, my name is Alex Gregory, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker who serves the McNeil learning community. So I get to work with Dr. Eagleton and Officer Watson all the time. Um, the McNeil learning community has 11 campuses. So I serve those 11 campuses, but my office is at McNeil. So I get to see these fine people every day. Um, as a social worker, Dr. Grosso touched on this, but as a social worker in our learning communities, we provide services to students from pre-K to 12th grade who are experiencing significant stressors or trauma or mental health issues that are really impacting their academic success. And this can include anything from providing a family with some basic needs like emergency food assistance to helping a family navigate a really horrific trauma that's, that's um, impacted them and helping the students get back on track academically. In addition to being a social worker at McNeil, um, I am also the very proud handler of Winter, one of our therapy dogs. Um, Macy Loera, the other McNeil Learning Community social worker, is the other handler for Winter. Um, and we just went a couple weeks ago, we had the amazing opportunity to go to a very intensive law enforcement therapy canine training where um, we worked very, very hard and we did certify. So we are now a nationally certified therapy canine team. Um, and that's going to open up so many other opportunities for our department and district. So we're super excited about that. Um, this is my second year in Round Rock ISD, but prior to joining the Round Rock ISD team, I was in another district as a school social worker for 10 years. And what really brought me over to Round Rock ISD was the unique partnership between school-based law enforcement and school-based mental health, because it was a need that I was seeing um, in my work as a school social worker, that trust and collaboration between officers and social workers. And so as soon as I found out about this very unique partnership that was happening in Round Rock ISD, I was like, yes, I need to be a part of that team. So, and then I'm lucky enough to be here. Um, I do want to point out, and I knew Alex wouldn't tell y'all this, the year before she came here, she was named the Texas School Social Worker of the Year. So we felt very fortunate that she wanted to come and join our team. Um, she's also bilingual with Spanish, and her co-partner, Macy, it just got certified in ASL. Um, and so I think it's important to highlight how we try as much as we can to be able to serve the, the students within our learning communities. Okay, awesome. And so lastly, we have our superintendent, Dr. Hafed Azaiz. So Dr. Aziz, if you could introduce yourself and, and why the police department is important in Round Rock ISD. Yeah, well, first of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the staff for being here, but also our community members as we try to uh, work together, right, to, uh, to keep our students safe in our campuses. Um, obviously, what we're trying to do here is really disrupt uh, everybody probably knows about this, right, is the school to prison pipeline, right? We don't want that to happen in our district. So uh, obviously, is the system perfect? Obviously, I don't think anything is perfect. Every, there's always room for improvement, right? But the, the question is, how can we help ensure again that we're disrupting um, that, that, that school to, to prison pipeline and make sure again that our students are kept safe in our campuses? Our parents said that most precious uh, things that they have, which is their kids, to, to spend the day with us every day, right? And to learn with us. And so they expect their kids to come back to them at the end of the day, uh, also back safely, right? So it is our job to make sure that they're not only learning, but also they're kept safe uh, and also felt very welcome and cared for every day with us. So um, obviously, I want to commend the team for really working together to try to figure out what are the best way to help make that happen for our students and for our parents. So, um, okay, I don't wanna, I don't wanna delay anymore. I wanna, I know that our community submitted a lot of questions already and I see a lot of questions already submitted even now. So I know uh, we only have a limited amount of time. So we're gonna try to answer as many questions and listen uh, to the concerns or, and, and suggestions to our communities. But this is just one meeting. Obviously, we our plan is to continue this conversation, these meetings, and even have an in-person as well in the near future. Thank you. 
So as Dr. Az said, that brings us to our question and answer portion of the evening. Um, so again, for our audience members here, please use the Q&A function um, in our Zoom. And we have a bunch of questions that were submitted beforehand by people who unfortunately couldn't be able or weren't able to be with us today. Um, so we're going to go ahead and kick off our questions um, with one that was submitted. And so the first one that we have is, why are the police and behavioral department, um, behavioral health department in the same, under the same umbrella? Why aren't they separate and can they be separate? So, um, so I, I might just start with why are they together? If someone, I think uh, Mr. Soto has some history on how we came to where we are with community involvement. So um, maybe you could speak to that, Sam, or uh, if not, we can we can take it from here. I think uh, I can speak to a little bit of that, but not the initiate the initial part of it. So I think that's Dr. Grosso that would have more more of a of a pertinent answer to that. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly all the whys. Like I was hired within this position and right here, I can tell you how it works and why it's important. And this is from the feedback I get from our social workers of how works happens and the importance of our departments together. Um, I think there's some misinformation out there that sometimes happen, like we're doing something different. So I think there can be some, um, when there's unknown, right, we sort of make a, we can sort of think what's really happening. Um, while we're in the same department, we do function very differently. Um, we work together. We each have our lane. We stay in our lane. Police are responsible for policing and we're responsible for the mental health of our students. Um, so often when officers in traditional policing are called to a situation that does involve mental health, they're asked to be an expert on a lot of things that they maybe don't have the training, the expertise in. So us being together, it means that when an officer does encounter someone, they know immediately that they can call the social worker and not just they can, they need to call the social worker. Mm -hmm. And then that way, that the mental health needs of our students are being able to be addressed. I would say we get so many referrals um, from our officers to the social workers just saying, hey, can you check in on this student? Or it seems like something's going on. Can you please just put a, like pick them up on your caseload? Um, it doesn't mean then the social worker goes back and tell all that information to the officer at all. It just means we got the referral and we were able to help at that point. Um, I also want to clear up some misinformation. Um, our files are completely separate in the same way the officers are. Both of our um, professions have very strict guidelines of how we handle our information and how that can be shared. Um, you know, for social workers, we're under FERPA, of course, because we work in a school district, but we're un also under HIPAA. So the only people who have access to our files is our team. So that's me and then the social workers. Th that's it. In the same way the officers they are under CGIS, a lot of other acronyms that I'm not even, that's not my expertise. <laughs> and so the officer's files are also separate, the reports. Um, but the reason is, and I can say from the beginning, it seems with policing now, we're given two options, right? It's either status quo, how we've always policed, or absolutely no police. Um, chief will know more that there are certain times at schools we have to call police no matter what, even if you don't want to, it's part of our laws. Um, and so I think Round Rock really looked at what are the needs of our student and how can we do things differently, specifically with making sure we're not criminalizing juvenile behavior, how we're not arresting when there is other alternatives, how we can help ensure that students are getting their uh, mental health needs um, supported by a mental health expert, which is our social workers. And so I think those are the, some really keys that I think sometimes aren't completely understood because this model is different and it's really not anywhere else. Yeah, and I think um, working as a team allows us to develop a, a level of trust that is really important to be effective in each of our um, professions. And so because we train together and we work together, um, we also collaborate on policies and procedures. So we know that um, what situation needs a mental health lead and which situations need law enforcement leads. And so it's very smooth. And um, and you to see the officers and social workers working together, um, you can just see how, how relaxed both are and how much confidence they have in their partners. And I think that's really important. And that, that is communicated to the students, too, that are in crisis. They see, they see a calm and coordinated team working with them. Uh, you don't always get that out in the community. You know, if a social worker shows up with an officer, I'll tell you right now that I doubt if they know each other. 
and they're both going to have concerns about the other and why they're there. And it's not going to work smoothly and it's not going to have the outcome that you want. Here, we, we really drive those outcomes. And we've got we've got a lot of success stories to talk about and how that works well. Um, and, and on the police department side, you know, the difference between uh, a school based police department and your municipal police is that we have a vested interest in the student outcomes. We are part of the community here on campuses, and we want to make sure that the students that we are shepherding and watching over um, really do succeed in, in their efforts to get through school um, healthy and with, with a high degree of education. And so to that end, you know, we look for opportunities for diversion to uh, limit the number of times we have to uh, place a student into the criminal justice system. We'd much rather not. And so we have grants currently in for two big programs. One is uh, teen court diversion, where the students are um, um, brought before peers and given discipline among their peers. And, and if they successfully get through it, their criminal record goes away and they never have a cri criminal record. We're trying to get that installed here so that we have that option to us. And the other is we're looking to bring a, a person in for victim advocacy because, you know, most of our Children, uh, students that are arrested are arrested because of assaults where the victim insists on pressing charges. And under our, our criminal justice system, the police are not involved in that decision. It's really up to the victim whether or not they want charges filed. And so if we can get those victims to be more comfortable and have more faith in the system, they'll, they'll more likely to give us the latitude for diversion. And I think that's what we're really trying to get to, more children and more students into diversionary programs, as opposed to the criminal justice system. And that's where we really think we can make a difference. And also, I'd like to add to that is uh, a lot of our officers in our department are mental health officers as well. Hey, Jackie, I thought I thought I saw you raise a hand. I just wanted to add that, you know, uh, my experience with our, um, with our, with our school resource officers and with our social workers, you know, as Dr. Gross has said, they've, we've only had social workers for a couple of years. Um, but it has made a huge impact in, um, the timeliness of the recovery for the student that has had, um, has been in crisis. And one of the things that I see, um, you know, as a school leader is when we, uh, when we as an administrative staff, you know, determine that, we are going to need some backup to make sure that our campus stays safe and our student is safe and our staff is safe. Um, our officers come and very often they've already, you know, due to the nature of my um, campus being one where we have, you know, students with some mental health needs, um, they've already called the social workers to also come help, right? So we'll have the social worker uh, on standby ready to, to, to step in when they, uh, to help deescalate the situation. We have the officer standing by if they need to call, you know, EMS or some other um, community needs, they, they're there. And so it, it, it really is a well-oiled machine and it makes a big difference that they know each other so well. Um, uh, so I, I, I just wanna say that it's, it's been wonderful having them pair together for us and for our students. Okay, awesome. Alrighty, thank you all. Oh, so this the, the next question kind of piggybacks off uh, piggybacks off what you guys were just talking about. And so um, it's when when PD and, and behavioral health services work together, um, what are the safeguards in place to make sure that the information is private? When and why would you share records or information? Yeah, I, I think first, like I said, our records are completely separate. Um, that's it, It's the same way that they're separate from other people on a campus, right? So because our social workers are mental health professionals, they're governed by their code of exit, code of ethics, <laughs> and they all have their license. So, I mean, that's, that's very serious. Um, our department takes it really serious of how we handle those things. Um, for us, information can only be shared um, I mean, if there is a safety concern, right? Like if we're working with a student who is a threat to themselves, um, that trumps other things. Um, but the main thing is if there's a release of information um, and that's signed by the parent um, or guardian, um, we really, when we work with a student, unless it's in a very crisis situation, we always um, involve the parents in that decision. So we don't work with students unless the parent or guardian wants us to. That That is up to them. Um, they reach out, they get... Um, be able to explain what we can do. And then if they're going to share information, there is a release of information. Alex, I don't know if you want to share a little bit just from your perspective working on a campus with that too. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I'll kind of talk on the other side of it, um, that while our records are very confidential, just like the officer's records are very confidential and and we don't see what the other is doing, um, one of the great things about our partnership is that sometimes things will happen in the community that our social work team wouldn't necessarily know about. Um, but our officers are given information about that. And so when it's appropriate, Officer Watson or Officer Whalen or two McNeil officers may come in on a Monday and say, hey, this really horrible thing happened to this student. I We need to connect you with this student. Um, and so I think that that's one of the great things where when it's appropriate and when they're um, is consent to, to share that information that we can collaborate and help the student because it's all in the best interest of the student. We would never share confidential information with anyone um, unless it was absolutely need to know information. And of course, like as Dr. Grossa said, we always get release of information forms filled out. Um, the social work department has to have a referral with parent consent in place to work with a student long term unless it's a crisis situation um, or unless there's extenuating circumstances. Um, so, yeah, I think. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And do officers ever refer uh, students for mental health services? Yeah, I think that happens regularly. It's, it really it happens more here than the alternative is when officers don't ask for mental health services and then they have to take other measures. And those are, outcomes are not as positive as getting mental health um, professionals involved early. And that's what our officers are trained to do is to really identify those situations where, um, where there are options available to us. We want to take those options as opposed to limiting ourselves to law enforcement engagements. So I don't know if anyone else on, on the panel may want to speak to that, but that, that's our overarching perspective. I, I can speak to that. Um, I will say in every every situation where an officer on at McNeil has worked with a student, whether they've been a victim of something or they've been on the other side where they have committed some sort of crime, um, our officers will always ask the parent, is it okay if I go introduce this student to the social worker just so they, they can see someone who can be in their corner and can help them? And so we'll have our officers coming in all the time to just say, hey, just wanted to introduce you to this student. Um, and the student's like, wow, I didn't even know you were here. That's awesome. And so that's been a really cool piece of it. And like Bandy mentioned in the beginning, our offices are right next to each other. Um, we're, they're not together. So there's definitely confidentiality when it comes to like students coming in and coming out and vice versa. Um, but we're very easily able to connect with each other. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so Good much. Um, our next our next co uh, question kind of picks up where Dr. AC mm -hmm. left off talking about the school to prison pipeline. And, and the question is, is, is what is the department doing to decriminalize behaviors and reduce the, the school to prison pipeline? Yeah, so I so, think that's that's why we're here, right? I mean, the reason why most of our officers have come to work in this in this district is for the opportunity to really to try to have an impact on that. We we, we all are here as advocates for the students, and I think we're hearing some of that today. Um, but I can tell you the small sampling of officers that are here with us tonight is just representative of the bigger um, the force, right? We're, we're all out there, and we're all trying to do what's best for the students. And, um, and I think the, the, what we're hearing tonight are just examples of that. Um, but, you know, the, there is the law, which we have to follow. And then there's the areas where we have discretion and anywhere where we have discretion, we always in favor, we always make those decisions in favor of the best student outcome. Um, you know, understanding there has to be consequences. Um, our officers do not get involved in disciplinary issues. Those are left to staff and, and that's, that's by design and that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, we are there to keep the, the, the campuses safe. And to the extent that we can, we want to have positive impact on the students that are on those campuses. If we have to be there to keep them safe, we might as well also contribute in a positive way to engagement with the students. And that's what we try to do each and every day. And I wanna say this too, that, you know, I think we use the, the phrase school to prison pipeline a lot and realizing that um, there are times when students are arrested, not while they're at school, right? Actually, they're arrested more 
because they're more out of school than they're in. And so one area where we're able to help is if a kid has been arrested outside of school, how do we support them when they're on our campus? Like they're going through this. Is that the officer being able to advocate for them or we us knowing that has happened so a social worker can get involved? And so I think that's another aspect that, um, you know, as Chief was saying, like we're not we're not looking to arrest, right? We know that kids minds aren't fully formed, right? Juveniles, they're not. Um, our, our brains aren't fully formed until we're in our 20s, if we're lucky. Um, and so, you know, our, our lives shouldn't be ruined by one mistake we make. And that's where we really can work in and have that discretion of, is it, um, it doesn't need to be arrest. It can be a discipline consequence instead by administration. And really knowing the, those areas of where it is that, you know, when we hire officers, it's not how, um, police departments traditionally hire law enforcement. Yeah. Okay. Coming from a past life in my previous district, um, I had hired 100 police officers as to statu statutorily in a two year time frame. Um, I would rather have not put an officer in uniform if it was the wrong officer. Uh, the officers we have on our staff are officers who want to be here. They are trained. Most of them are parents. Most of them have children and understand what it's like for a child to make a mistake. Okay, We understand that there are consequences. You don't need to be taken to prison to understand that. So we work together to solve the problem. Parents are a huge part of it. Huge. Anytime we're involved with a student, a parent should be contacted. So I, I want to quell that. I would rather not have an officer, and that is now what I'm in charge of. I would rather have a vacancy than put the wrong officer in that position. And I think you can talk a little bit about the process. Yeah, and I would love, Principal Soda, for you to talk about this too, since you've been on some of our interview panels with officers. But when we interview officers, it's not just the chief interviewing them. It is a panel in it. Uh, I'm always on those or our coordinator of social work services um, and sometimes the social worker so that we're able of different viewpoints of what uh, an officer, what type of officer we need and what is that mindset that we're looking for. Um, so Sam, I would love for you to jump in since you have been so critical in so many of our interviews. <laughs> So it's it's a, it's been a while. Um, I participated in interviews as I initially stated uh, back when the previous uh, uh, chief of, of Ram Rock ISD Police uh, was in place, and at that time, um, we focused. The questions were many of the questions were focused on disrupting the prison of pipeline, um, you know, channel, and uh, they were based uh, on around equity in terms of we really wanted to get the candidates perspective on where they stood when it came to policing and also issues of equity now uh, we all understand that these are complex issues um and not everybody is on the side of you know, one or the other or some of us stand on one, more on one side than on the other uh that's what i'm trying to say so we're trying to the, the goal at that time and i know that this is something that the department continues to work on um we got to keep in mind that you know, this police department, our district has is relatively new. Um, it's a handful of years, and um, uh, there's there's you know a uh, portion of our population in our district that you know does not want the department and never wanted it in the first place. And then there's you know another portion of our population in our district that is supportive of the police department. Uh, regardless of that, um, you know the the goal is to try, and the goal at that time and continues to be, to my understanding is to find officers that are going to be able to have students at the center of their work. Um, they're police officers, and they're not to be compared to counselors, and vice versa, counselors are not to be compared to police officers. We need both, right? We need social workers as well. Everybody plays an important role. Um, and at those, in those interviews, it was very clear that, that uh, we were trying to get the best candidates that would be uh, moldable, that would be open to training, um, and that, you know, not, not an individual that would know all the answers or pretend to know all the answers, because we had quite a few, uh, but they were coming from the policing perspective that their role was to come and, you know, make arrests, 
um, you know, keep everybody safe, et cetera. And then we had officers that were open to, you know, training in terms of, of, of issues of equity, of decriminalizing students. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's obviously a very complex issue, but I know that efforts have been made to try to bridge, uh, uh, you know, those two different areas, those two different worlds. All righty. Thank you so much, Sam. And this was just more so, I think this was just submitted as just a, a general knowledge question, but um, is there is there a police officer at every campus? And if not, it, are there plans to add one to every campus? So uh, no, currently we don't have officers assigned to every campus. We don't have that many officers. And I think if we uh, if we're very uh, strategic about our use of resources, we don't necessarily need to have an officer on every campus. I've seen that model. Um, I've seen it not work very well. Um, but I do think that um, you have to have the right number of officers to be able to provide a, uh, a reasonable response. And that's what we're working toward. And so um, I think uh, I'll maybe defer a little bit to the superintendent in terms of what his vision is for the future. But, uh, you know, we're still a work in progress. All righty. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, is going back to just kind of what we were talking about, about how we serve students and how we, we tackle issues. And the question is, is do you arrest students for, for vapes? And how do you determine um, if an arrest needs to be made when something happens? Yeah, so we, we don't typically um, arrest for vapes. Um, so I can tell you that we've had, for this school year, we've had um, 13, 13. 17 arrests, only one of those was for um, drugs. And that one was uh, an, an individual, a student who had 15 vapes on them. And so if you know anything about vapes, and I'm not assuming that our audience does, um, you know, a typical vape will last a student for a few days if they're smoking and or anyone for that matter. But when you have 15 on you, that tells us that you're distributing on campus or you're selling on campus or you have some other intent. And so that in, in our mind, that individual is more of a threat to the campus in terms of um, putting more students in touch with narcotics and drugs. And so uh, that particular case, that student was arrested uh, and the father was aware of it and was part of the process. Um, that's the only case that we've had this year. Now, um, we've taken reports on 73 possessions. So you can see out of 73 reports we've taken, only one has actually resulted in an arrest. So we try every opportunity not to go the route of arrest, but that doesn't mean that we're not mandated by law at some point to actually go through the process. And, and in general, how, how does the department determine if arrest needs to be made for, for a situation? It's the, it's the level of uh, aggrievement, uh, you know, um, it's whether or not there's violence involved, it's whether or not the victim wants to pursue charges. It's whether or not there's a threat to the overall safety and security of the campus. There are a lot of things that go into, into it. It's not, it's not done um, unless it's absolutely necessary to make sure that we can maintain safety, security, um, or, or we're mandated by law under the circumstances. One, I will say the numbers Chief gave of 17 this year, 13 of those have been victim initiated. And so I was, we said, when there's a victim, the victim makes the decision, not anybody within the police department, not even like a principal doesn't get to make that decision. The superintendent doesn't. That's definitely, and that's by law, that the victim, and you don't interfere with what the victim wants to do. Thank you. Can I add that, you know, as an administrator on a school campus, if we find that a student has a vape, uh, that interaction starts with us. So we're determining whether or not, you know, uh, the student is in possession of a vape. And then typically I will see, um, you know, check to see if that is a THC vape or if that is a nicotine vape. Um, if it's the nicotine vape, our officers aren't involved at all with that. That's a student code of conduct problem. Um, and we consequence that and discipline that on our own. If it's a THC vape, then we may uh, check with officers because now we're in possession of illegal drugs, right? So they have to be involved with that. Um, but then we also, if a student is in possession of THC, unlike what, what Chief was talking about, we are, the administrators are taking the discipline for that student. That's not something that uh, law enforcement is involved in most of the time. So it really starts at administrative level and um, 
it's very, I would, I would argue that it's infrequent that we have to involve officers in uh, student behavior and student um, misbehavior. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie, for adding that. Um, and so our next question is, um, is, can you provide a specific example of, of a situation where a police officer would handle the situation rather than a counselor or social worker? And, and how often do situations like that occur? I can take that one. Um, if, if that's okay, Chief. I, I will tell you that it's very often that we have officers come when the student's in his, his life is in danger. So, you know, as you know, I, I, I work on a specialized campus and there have been times when um, our student has in, you know, uh, in an area of uh, our campus that is unsafe, like where there's cars, um, where we have traffic issues. And those are things when I have to have a law enforcement officer help with that situation. And, and they do, right? They're stopping traffic. They're getting, uh, you know, uh, help. Um, and then we're also getting mental health help for the student as well. So um, it, it's... At like uh, I think Sam was talking about earlier, everyone has their role to play and our teams are very clear about what their roles are in the situation, especially in a crisis. We have to be really clear about whose role is what and, and what we're going to do about it. And very often our officers are, are waiting to step in, right? They don't step into a situation until we've asked them to step into it. Now, if they, of course they see somebody uh, going for traffic that you, you don't, you, you, they step in, right? But um, uh Everyone knows their role. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is, Is um, do police officers ever physically restrain students? Why would they have to do that? Yeah, I think that builds off of what uh, Ms. Hartle was just saying, is that there are times when we're going to have to restrain a student for their own safety or for the safety of others. Uh, and that's the only time it really happens, unless they're being placed under arrest for some some conduct that they've committed, which is criminal, which is going to result in their arrest. So those are the only limited times that we actually have physical restraint. Um, and, and again, we always defer to staff um, as a first step. And then we always back staff up. Uh, if it gets beyond what they can control or handle safely, then we step in and we assist. And I will say, you know, this is where we're all learning, right? Like our administrators learn at the same time. Um, of when it is the officer to step in and not like we've had situations, I think, where, you know, administrators maybe want officers to step in before they're even allowed to. And so it's the officer being able to have that conversation with the administrator and being able to say, like, we, we can't do that. Like, there, there are lines that we can't cross there and that this needs to be handled by the campus, not by law enforcement. And so I think this this next question kind of piggybacks off that um, is what exactly is an unsafe behavior uh, when you when you would call the police room or what would what kind of situation would you describe as unsafe behavior and is there another choice depending on the situation that really rests in in the uh, in the perspective of the person who is in that situation you know it's when they don't feel safe or it's when they're feeling threatened that's when they'll that's when they'll call. I, I do want to say that, though, um, on any campus, anything that would precipitate a 911 call will have us respond. So, you know, it's it's up to the individual um, caller. If they feel they need a 911 response, they're going to have a police officer or EMS or fire responding, depending on what they communicate to the, the 911 center. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, our offices are fairly busy. Um, and we stay very much focused on where in our lane doing what we need to be doing. And any time that we have available, we usually spend on campuses checking, uh, checking doors and things like that to make sure they're secure. So, you know, the officers stay busy all day long, but they're available whenever um, requested for emergencies. And typically, you know, we'll, we'll hear more often than not, it's when it's a violent situation and staff is really um, in fear for their own safety. And that's typically when we get called on an emergency call. When I even wonder, Dr. Eagleton, if you can talk about it from as being a high school principal of when it is that it needs to be the officer. And I know you have close relationships both with your officer and the social workers. Well, I, I think uh, what Chief, I mean, just described really is, is the perfect explanation for it. Um, most of the time it has to do with that. I mean, whether you're talking about a weapon of some sort um, or you're 
there's a possibility that there may be a weapon of some sort, um, whether there's intentional harm to that individual themselves. I mean, sometimes in a high school, you may have an individual with some type of a weapon, whether it's um, it could be a variety of things um, that they may um, might, may not be intending to hurt someone else, but they may be wanting to hurt themselves. And so um, kind of bringing them into that role. But really, I mean, at a high school, especially a 6 day high school like Manila, all of our high schools in our district, it's very large. It's a, basically a mini city. So you have a lot of opportunities to kind of determine um, what those things are. Um, and so most of the time, I mean, it, it could be, uh, you were mentioning earlier about, um, about charges and arrests, whether it's assault um, and somebody's experiencing that or um, they're engaged in that, you know, it's, it's a difference at a high school between student confrontation, I'm arguing, to now I'm on top of a kid and I'm just beating their head in or slamming them against the wall. So, you know, both you can say is a fight on the administration side of things, but the difference in that in terms of of uh, policing is, is different. Student confrontation, police is probably not going to do anything besides administration, break the kid up. But if there is uh, someone who's getting, whose life is really, really in danger beyond just words back and forth, um, you're bringing them in. And so typically um, for us, it's some type of, whether it's drugs potentially, and depending on what type they are, or some type of very serious uh, issue or potential issue um, that's dealing with the weapon is where we really bring them into that point. For us in a high school, uh, particularly at my campus, because our officers are so great and so visible, um, if, if something is needed from them, they're readily available. Um, but they have, they know somebody mentioned earlier, it might have been Ms. Hartle, I think, was talking about um, the roles and the lanes in which we operate in. And so they're available, but they don't move until we're clear that, hey, Bandy, this is beyond me now. Um, I need you to, to help. And so, um, I think somebody else mentioned it to, to that point as well. The clarity piece is proactively. So um, engaging in conversations a lot from administration in my campus to our officers is very, very key so that when an issue arises, you're not really trying to debate or figure out whose job is this. You've already established that beforehand. And so the safety, um, whether it's me or my staff um, acting or if it's the police department, we already know clearly where we start, where we stop. And so safety is quickly reestablished in that aspect. Um, but basically, even in high school, to answer your question directly, Dr. Coso, it really has to do with the level of, of um, severity, um, typically with weapons, assault, um, and drugs, depending on even what they are, though. Well, Mr. Soto, I think, too, it would be great for you to talk about, like, when are times you've needed to call for police, like what are those situations? Because I think sometimes at an elementary school, it is quite different. Absolutely. Um, I'm hearing Dr. Eagleton um, talk about his experiences, and I know that there's there has to be uh, uh, parents on this on this uh, call that are you know that that have children at the elementary level, middle school level, secondary. Uh, when I say secondary, I'm talking about middle school and high school. You know, they have SROs uh, for the most part on their campuses, one or two probably more at the elementary level. We do not have SROs on any campuses on a permanent basis. Nevertheless, they do uh, cycle through, like uh, uh, Officer Max mentioned earlier uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, he's assigned to a certain number of, of campuses. Um, I know that's probably changed uh, since the previous administration, but, you know, he, he does cycle through. I will tell you that at the elementary level, and this is just, I, I can't speak for all elementaries, but, um, after speaking to some of my colleagues, um, I know that when we call, we call when it's as a last resort. And, and, it, and it's not so much for a student as it is for perhaps a parent or a community member or a, I say community member, but more of a stranger that might be belligerent, that, that may be uh, uh, demonstrating some signs of aggression. Um, unfortunately, here on my campus last year, uh, I had a, you know, a, a, a parent that, uh, uh, would escalate very easily and uh, would begin to um, um, shout profanity at, at staff and myself uh, in in the building and and often outside the building. Uh, and that's when I would you know find it deem it necessary to call law enforcement so that they would be able to um, uh, de-escalate the situation with that adult. But it was a, an adult to adult interaction. 
Um, I don't call uh, police officers uh, for issues that have that has to do with uh, student discipline um, unless there's a weapon involved of some sort. Um, you know, then then and and by a weapon, I would mean if there was a gun um, or a BB gun that you know looks like a real gun, then I would you know find that uh, deem that necessary to make that phone call. And unfortunately, I've had to make that phone call already. Um, and law enforcement is quick to to answer. But even when they're here, like Jackie said, Ms. Hartle, um, we administrators are the ones that take the the we're the you know we're the ones who take the lead on this. Um, the law enforcement handles that side of it, um, but you know we're the ones who are making the parent phone calls. We're the ones who are talking to the students. Um, the way I operate is once I've you know discussed the situation with the student and and the parent. I offer the parent the opportunity to see a counselor, uh, you know, and see if they're, if, if they're okay with, you know, referring the, the student, their child to a counselor that we have here. I'm fortunate to house one of our social workers that, that serves the Ron Rock learning community. Um, and, and, uh, and we have access to that person. We go through the proper channels of, of, you know, referring the student to social, a social worker needed, but, you know, we do have that, that easy accessibility. Um, so I think it, it depends. It, it depends significantly um, on the on the situation and also at the elementary level, you know, we're not making those type of phone calls or the or the need for an SRO as much as secondary. Um, I'll tell you when I would like an SRO. I, I I need an SRO. You know, heaven forbid there is ever a situation like in Nashville or Ovalde or anything like that. That's what we're going to call immediately, and and they better get themselves over here ASAP. Um, otherwise, you know, we. We have other wraparound services that that help um, uh, for situations that have to do with student discipline or any or you know mental health issue uh, issues. I should say. I'll just um, if you don't mind, I'll just add this as Mr. Soto was talking about that. I was thinking too at the high school level. There are also times where there are some um, legal issues that are happening. For example, um, at the high school level, I've had to deal with. Um, court order that are um, restraining orders and things like that from certain individuals from restricting them from accessing our campus or being on campus or accessing our children. And so there are times where it's not necessarily a weapon or, or a fight or an assault that's happening, but it's also bringing SROs in in their lane because of their training to make them aware that we're receiving this. So uh, I'm handling um, or, or our social workers handling the social emotional aspect of the child who may have experienced trauma from some type of adult, whether it's a family member or whoever, but also um, making sure from a legal aspect that deputies are aware uh, if there's a court order that's saying, you know, this individual cannot be at this campus, just keeping them aware so that uh, as they are, you know, checking our perimeters and, and our parking lots and things of that nature, they're also um, aware of what's happening to ensure and prevent any type of mishap from happening. And so um, it's vitally important for me because that's part of their training um, in terms of, you know, and I'm not meaning just allegations, but I'm talking about real life, you know, court orders where, you know, this kid can't st or this person can't be within so many feet. Um, now, certainly the SRO doesn't go out in the community and find that person. Um, that's not their role, but to make sure that at the campus level, they are aware and or if I need to ask questions about what I'm reading or what I'm seeing, because that's the area of training. So it's not just assault, it's a lot of prevention as well. Um, so while we're dealing with the kid and social workers or myself or whoever is dealing with the child, we also bring in SROs from the legal aspect to ensure that our campus is safe and our events are safe as well. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Eagleton. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to our next question. And it's how are SROs making sure that students feel protected and safe with the officer rather than afraid of them? What are you guys doing to ensure that students feel safe to utilize and seek mental, mental health services? It's a two-parter, so if you got to break it up, please feel free. I would love for our officers to chime in on this because I know these are things they do every day. So I can answer the, the first part of it. So at the middle school, at the high school, I mean, we have an open door policy. You know, I mean, our door is always open to these students and our main objective is to build some type of relationship with these students. You know, I mean, like uh, Officer Watson was saying, we're out in the hallways, 
know, we're out during, we're out at the cafeteria during lunch. Not only that, but we try to attend outside events. You know, we like going to their basketball games, we like going to their baseball games or their, you know, their dance, their recitals and whatnot. I feel like that way kids see as they show, we, we show them that we care and we show that we're there for them, you know, so that way, whenever they see us at school, we're, we're approachable. They can trust us. And that's one of, one of the methods that we use. You also got to be able to, I know being in a high school, you got to be able to speak the lingual too. I mean, you got to talk the way they talk. They kind of let them know that, you know what, he's not just a person in a uniform that, you know, only talks to me when something bad happens. And that's what I do. I mean, I, I, I sit there, I crack jokes with them. I'm out there and, you know, like Max said, in the gym, whatever I can do to kind of ease that tension of the stereotype that we get, I'm willing to do that. So, but in high school, you definitely got to be able to speak the lingo that they speak. So it's as far as getting on IG live or the TikToks and all that good stuff. You got to be able to let them know that you're, I might be older, but I'm still a little wiser as well. So. And, and as, as Dr. Grosso said earlier, you know, most, most all of us officers have kids. So we understand what it's like to, to be with kids and work with kids and relate with kids. And we explain to the, these kids, we were kids too. We understand we make mistakes. We don't want um, to punish you for a mistake as long as it's not a detrimentalist mistake that we have no other choice. Like as, as chief said, if, you know, we have a victim on a, a certain crime or whatever. Um, but we, we like to hang out with the kids. We like to go to their events. We like to go to their band events, their pack events, um, ROTC events, anything that we can do to interact with these kids. Um, because as, as Bandy said, most of us are actually kind of like, even though we're older, we're inner kids. So we like to go out and have fun and goof around with them and show them that we're human. Even though we have to wear all this fun gear, um, we're normal and human, just like you are outside of, of school. So we try to let them know that they can come talk to us about anything, whether it's a bad day, a good day, coming to talk about a TV show or a new movie that's out or a new TikTok it came out that everyone's talking about. We just try to interact as much as we can with them um, and, and, and be there for them, like all of, you know, everybody else. And um, so the next question, it, it kind of goes off of that. Do do officers undergo training to support students' mental health or um, or to support students going through that? Is there any training involved in that? Uh, Texas requires uh CIT training, which is a 40 hour course um, that requires you to learn de escalation. Uh, it also takes into the various levels of mental health. Um, we have mental health first, uh, first, aid, first youth. aid youth. Uh, I'm a trainer in that. Um, the officers are going through that. They're required to take a, uh, a deaf and hard of hearing course coming up. So it's required of us. But um, like they keep saying, it's all a part of we're not here to be a counselor. We're not here. We're just uh, just like anyone would let, want to be listened to. It's just another set of ears, another set of eyes, another adult on campus to listen and help them through their bad day. I think we're also proactive on the training too. I know, Amy, we've got um, some grants coming in for additional training. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, and I think one thing is that, and I've heard from many of our officers and many of them are mental health officers, which means they took above and beyond about mental health. But a lot of times that doesn't cover how to work with school age kids, right? Like how man mental health manifests in elementary, middle, and high school is vastly different than some adults. And so that's the mental health first aid use that we did just get a grant to have more people trained as trainers. And so that's available not only to our officers, but others. So making sure they see that. But, and I want to be clear, as Chief said, they're not counselors, they're not the social workers, but it's important for them to understand what mental health um, struggles look like and what are some warning signs so that they know to contact. And 
you know, we talk a lot about the social worker, but they also contact the school counselors um, at times, you know, so they know, okay, this kid's struggling. And they know we train the like they they get enough knowledge to know that who is the professional that can intervene in the same way if it's a safety issue like the social workers know they can't get involved in that until the situation is secure for their own safety because they're not trained in that um, and that's where we really stay in our lanes um, I think also just in our conversations because we um, have conversations we are able to talk things through our officers get to learn about what does trauma look like? Like what is, um, how does that manifest? How, what does a trauma response look like? In addition, um, as you can tell, um, Jackie has a great relationship with our officers and stuff, but it's really our officers getting to know our, our staff that works with students who receive special education services. So then they understand um, preemptively, what are the student's triggers? How, how can they be calmed down? And so that they learn from our professionals, right? Like our, and this is because we have our own department, we get to dictate what training that they go through. If they're from an outside agency, we have no control over that. And so that we can really work and use the special, the, like the specialties within our district, like our special education staff, um, our mental health staff, our school counselors, all of us get to partner together and learn from one another and be able to Rest assured that I don't have to be the expert on everything mm -hmm. and I can stay in my lane because I know who can do that. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Grosso. Uh, the next question is about the about our therapy dogs. Um, so you refer to it as, as a canine or therapy do dog program. Which, which one is it and what is the difference? Um, sorry. So it's, it's, it's all the same. I mean, a canine is, is, is just a dog, you know, that's, that's what we refer to, um, as, as a canine, um, department. And so that way people understand that it's a, a, a unit within the police department. So canine is just, your a dog handler for those, for those dogs, basically. Um, and the, the therapy dog so it's, it's basically your, your therapy dogs are certified dogs that are through um, the AKC and they're going to be through which is a canine good citizen. And so they're different. A therapy dog is different than like an emotional support dog. So an emotional, you know, an emotional support dog is pretty much mostly all of our dogs that are at home that, you know, we love them. They can help us. They can comfort us. But sometimes they're just like, okay, I'm done with you. Like, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Get away from me. Therapy dogs are here to help comfort and support. They're not aggressive. They're not mean. They want to be there to work. They want to be there to help um, when you are in, in distress. And as we all know, most everybody has dogs. Our dogs know when we're upset, when we're having a good day, when we're having a bad day, when we're mad. And most of them are right there with you. Hey you okay, mom, you okay, dad, you know, we want to make sure that you're okay. And so that's one of the things that is great about this program is that when someone's having that bad day and having that bad moment, they can call us and we can come help deescalate the situation and, and kind of maybe help their day a little bit better. Um, and even if they're not having a bad day, we go out and do a lot of different events within the district. We, um, we go to different functions. We'll go to career days um, to just talk because when people think of canines in a police department, they automatically think, oh, they're the patrol dogs. They're the bite dogs. They're the dogs that are going to come get me. They're a drug dog. They're the that's not what we, when we founded the canine program here, that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to completely start and do a different program for Round Rock ISD to help the mental and behavior health of everyone. And even if that's five minutes with a dog and it makes their day a whole lot better than the normal stigma of, oh, okay, a dog's in a school, what are they here to be doing? Well, now it's, we're here to help you and, and comfort and support you and, and just make your day. And like I said, even though, even if it's staff members, we try to help everyone. Um, and we are integrated with the, um, uh, our behavioral, 
department and like I said, our social workers. So it's not just police officers that have dogs. It's not just social workers. And so we're just there together. Like we're here to help the students and staff any way that we can mitigate from be, you know, behavioral incidents and crisis situations. And if that's having, you know, we have a lot of students that are excited to see the dogs. So they know, Hey, we're going to have the dog come visit, you know, on a Thursday or whatever that gives them something to look forward to. And they've noticed that a lot of times it's helped cut down on behavioral issues and things like that, knowing that they have something to look forward to and having a dog come visit them. Hey, Alex, can you talk about some of the work <laughs> you and Macy do with winter? Cause I know, Y'all have done some great work with some of our students in different situations. Yes, and I will try not to keep us here until midnight. Um, but on the, the police side of it, I just wanted to add, so part of this awesome training that Macy Winter and I got to attend um, gave us specific training in helping police in situations and helping victims of crimes that have been committed. Um, and I am super excited that one of them is going to actually be able to happen um, this semester or next semester. So one of the things that Winter was trained in how to do is how to provide comfort to a youth, a child or adolescent when they're testifying in a trial. Um, if, if a judge were to allow the therapy dog in the courtroom. So of course it's up to the judge to decide whether or not the therapy dog can be present um, but we unfortunately have a student who um, in our learning community who may have to be a part of that process. And so winter and this student has a very good relationship with winter. And so if if it is to that point where the student has to testify, we will request because winter has this awesome training, we'll request that winter be present with her while she testifies. Um, winter could also go to forensic interviews whenever um, a, a really awful thing happens to a child and they need to have this special interview with law enforcement. And it can be a really scary situation. Winter can go with the child to provide some comfort. Um, and then on the, the non-law enforcement side on our just day-to-day -day work. So Winter participates in talk therapy. Um, she doesn't actually do the talking. It's normally the student and myself. Um, but she will be present for therapy sessions if the student wants her to be. Um, Macy and I go to different elementary campuses and do groups. Um, we have a group of students at one elementary and they were referred for various reasons like social anxiety um, or they had had a really awful loss in their family. Um, they may be in the foster care system. And so we do a group with those students and just one tiny success. Um, I could talk for hours about how amazing winter and the therapy dog program is. Um, but we had a student at one of these elementary campuses where we do a consistent group. And one of the first times we met with a student, the student did not say a word. Um, she was completely nonverbal. She would nod a little bit, but didn't want to get close to winter, didn't want to get close to us. She had very, very bad anxiety. Um, and so we just sat with it with her. Um, we gave her some stickers. We gave her one of Winter's little cards and then she left. Um, fast forward to now um, and it's been a few months. She comes running into the door immediately, not into the door, into the room, through the door. Um, she immediately goes to Winter, hugs Winter and immediately starts telling us all about what's been happening that week. Um, she'll talk to us about her coping strategies. She'll ask to help groom winter. Like we bring some little cloths for the students to wipe winter down. Um, so that's just one, one tiny little thing that winter has been able to do. Um, and among our campuses, everyone knows winter. So even the students who don't receive social work services, no winter. And when we're in the hallways, they're like, hey, winter. Um, winter is in the yearbook um, at various campuses. Winter is in the the news. She was on an elementary's um, little news that they do in the morning. So she 
and the other therapy dogs are very well integrated into our Round Rock ISD community. And it's amazing. And I love it. I do want to mention that the therapy dog program, it's a partnership with partners in education. They're the ones that got sponsors for the dog. And so the dogs are training and stuff. It, that, that's how they're funded is through that. Yeah. And I just want to add too, just personally, um, you know, uh, last week I was having a particularly stressful day and Lisa and Puff were just stopping in the building to say hello. And I guess Puff read my, my stress level and something that Puff hadn't done before is came over and just laid down next to me. Um, un, unprovoked just came over and just laid down and, and literally sat next to me for about 20 minutes while we were talking. And um, it just made my, it just reduced my anxiety that day. And just that personal experience, just, they just have a way of doing that. And that's, that's what they're designed and trained to do. And, and they do it really well. Um, they can read people, uh, they can read their anxiety levels, and they can feed off of that in a way that they're trained to respond. The other thing I just want to point out is that as the program develops, what we really want to be able to do is, is hit certain campuses on, on testing days, you know, because we've, what we've seen is on testing days with the dogs, they actually lower the anxiety for the students before they go in. And, you know, it's our hope that we can have some better outcomes on the testing. And I think that there's some studies going on to see if that is actually the case. And I'm curious, uh, Mr. Soto or uh, Ms. Hartle, do you, I know y'all both have had interactions with the therapy dogs on your campus too, if y'all have any perspective or thoughts about the program. The program has been wonderful for us. We have some students who, um, you know, when they uh, are triggered and become escalated or are highly anxious, um, you know, if Sergeant Clear or um, uh, some of our social workers that, that are dog handlers can come over with the dog, then it almost instantly um, resets their brain um, and helps them just um, distract from whatever those thoughts were that were that were sort of spinning around for them. So it's been very, very helpful. Um, and it's also something that our kids can look forward to. Um, I think as, as um, I think Mr. Soto was talking about, you know, you, or I, mean, I think it was Sergeant Clear, they, re, they also get to look forward to the dogs coming. Um, so they also come through, you know, pretty regularly uh, just to say hi. And I will say that we had on a professional development day, we had, um, you know, because our, our jobs can be stressful. We had uh, the therapy dogs there for our staff. And I didn't know how that would go over. Um, but very, very popular uh, time <laughs> session. So um, it has been it's been wonderful. Hey, awesome. Thank you guys so much. I know that we're, we're getting closer to the end. So I just want to do one more round to see if there's anything that anyone would like to share as far as something you'd like the community to know. And then we'll close it out with our final question. So anyone who would like to go, please feel free. I want to say, since I've had the opportunity to sit in, especially with so many of the first officers that we've hired, that we hired, that, you know, we are talking about we look for officers who um, are wanting to help our students, that they're not wanting to arrest, that they're wanting to be a positive influence and help students out of those mistakes that can be made. At the same time, and I think it's um, critical now more than ever with events that happened on Monday, in Nashville, we also have to look for officers that don't run away from danger. And I know many times it's a very, um, to be in the situation looking and realizing what we're asking from our officers in those situations, um, that we do ask, you know, that they, they're they both sides of that, that they are that advocate mentor, but they also, if something is going down, they run towards it when everybody else is running away because that's their job. And so I, I just I just want to highlight that too from our officers um, because th th that's what we're asking of them. Yeah, and I think um, philosophically, we look at ourselves as, as shepherds and what we're trying to do is protect the flock from the wolves. And so, you know, it's, it's, we want to be there in a nurturing way, um, but we're also there in the event we have to protect. And we have to be able to change really quickly between those two modes. And uh, we train we train for that. Um, we're constantly working with our partners in the community, you know, the different police agencies, the different fire departments. We try to work with them to develop uh, protocols, make sure our responses are quick and effective. Um, we wanna make sure that we're serving our campus communities to the best we can. 
And I just want to take the moment before we break to really thank all the officers here today and our social workers for all the great work that they're doing. I want to, I want to thank the, um, the staff that took the time out of their busy, very busy day um, to help uh, communicate what we, what we do every day. It uh, really means a lot. And uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for that. All righty. I know we're getting close to that time, but one more question um, is this, are there, are there going to be any more opportunities for community engagement as far as our police department and safety and security in our district? Yeah. Um, sure well, first, go ahead. Go ahead, Chief. No, I, I certainly want to do more um, of enga community engagement. I really want to get around to the specific campuses more and really talk with the parents and the staff. I'm, mm -hmm. hope, I'm hoping to have the bandwidth to be able to do that more in the coming year as we do. Um, because we are a growing department and there's so many um, administrative and compliance requirements that I've been dealing with for the first several months of my time here. I really want to start to be more out in the field and working with our staff and meeting our parents and, and, and seeing some of the students. And that's my hope. So, yes, I hope there will be more of these. Yeah, uh, I just want to add a few things. First of all, I want to again thank our police officers, our social workers and everyone who's serving on this panel. Uh, for I know it's it's a short amount of time. We're trying to answer as many questions as we can, but I know also there are a lot more questions to be answered, and also uh, we also need to really hear from our um, uh, more from our community members and parents. But also want to thank everyone who really took the time to be to listen to this conversation tonight. Uh, it's really as I said, you know, I think we have we're doing a great lot of good work very good work actually and i think there's also a lot that they can do we can do more i know um you know every time you know a tragedy like it what happened in tennessee uh, this this week i mean it's just tragic right and you know we don't want that to happen anywhere and and specifically we don't want it to be happening here on rock isd so we are always trying to figure out a way how we can fix things and make things better to ensure the safety for our uh, students, our staff, and everyone really uh, within our school districts and our community. So I wanted to know um, to our parents, our community members, we're here to listen. Uh, we will be scheduling um, uh, more of these um, and probably in person as well. Obviously, we'll have to talk with, with the team here to figure out when that will be and we'll be sharing this information with you. But again, I mean, we it takes a village, all of us working together to help our, uh, our students and keep everyone uh, really uh, safe. Uh, as I said, so thank you everyone for taking the time tonight. Um, again, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank every all of our attendees for being here with us tonight and for their questions. I know there were a lot of questions that we that we received, and if your question wasn't answered, please reach out to uh, reach out to us on Let's Talk. You can find that at roundrockisd.org. Um, and also for those who are unable or, or for those who would like to watch again, a recording of this meeting will be on the district safety and security website, and will be posted with closed captioning on our social media channels. So with that, I want to wish everyone a good night and thank you so much for being here again.